Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Thanks for listening to The Sword and the Trowel today. So glad to have you with us. And uh, we sure hope that you're attending the conference. We're dropping it right now in the middle of That's conference right. you week. You should be on your way here. You should totally be <laughs> on your way to the conference. And if you're not, when you're listening to this, like on the Tuesday before the conference, hey, Maybe still show That's up at right. the door, knock on it. I don't know if there's going to be no, any space just left. Get get on MapQuest or Google Maps and see how far Cape Coral is from where you are, and calculate how many hours it'll take you to drive That's here. Right. And just come on, and make it happen, man. Make it happen. Um, we're so excited about a number of things going on at Founders right now. One of which is our recently updated FAM, and so we have um, various ways that you can join us and help us and support us in the work that is going on at Founders Ministries. There is a shield level you can. Come in. There is a trowel level to come in. There's a sword level, and there's a new level now called Ally. And if you That's go right. to founders.org and check out the fam, you'll find those levels and different resources that come your way as you join us, as you support us. And if you are a part of the fam, then you get access to the armory. In the armory, there's all sorts of content that's going up there on a regular basis. And a key piece of content that's going to be coming is the live stream of the conference. And so you can still join the fam. And what will happen is then you will get access to the armory and you'll get access to the live stream. So if you're not able to be with us at the actual conference, go ahead and join the fam and then you'll be able to join us online. Yeah, a couple of things just to mention about the conference is uh, Dr. Tom Nettles is going to join us for one of our panels during the conference. And we also um, uh, have Bob Coughlin, who's going to be leading us in singing during our times of worship as well. So uh, come, we'd love to have you. We've got a few seats left, I think, as of our last time to check. So we'd love to have you register and join us. Yes. So we're excited about this podcast. We have our dear friend, Pastor Jeff Johnson with us. Jeff is... uh, His heart has been tied to us in unique ways because he was down here. What was it now? Last Over year. a year ago uh, when you had your medical episode and collapsed. <laughs> I was actually thinking about the conference. But well, yeah, <laughs> that's good. It was wonderful to have him with us at the conference as well. And he did a wonderful job of preaching God's word. You can find his sermons actually on uh, on our YouTube channel. That's right. Actually, Jeff, I, I, I was interviewing you or we were talking Right, we were. Yeah, and then uh, that that session was being concluded by prayer when uh, the lights went out. That's so. right. And this for you, and then yes, it was um, a wild time. It was so sweet, Jeff. You were a great encouragement uh, to our congregation through yeah. the conference, and then you were a great encouragement that day, particularly as um, things got so crazy and wild here. But you are yeah. the pastor of Grace Bible Church and have been for sixteen years. Is that right? Mm-mm. I was going 21. Yeah. 21. I'll oh, see. I'll, I'm looking at your website. I'm looking at your website. <laughs> yeah. We got to update that. You it's updated that thing five years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you started that church, right? In your own apartment. I, yeah. I started an apartment um, in the year uh, 20, uh, I mean, 2000. And yeah. so we've been at it for almost 21 years now. Yes. And you've been author. You, so you've authored a number of books. Um, you've got The Kingdom of God. You've authored The Absurdity of Unbelief, just to name a few, and there's many more. Uh, You are the author of The Church, Why Bother?, which has now turned into a film. Right. It's just been released this last year. Mm. We're glad to have you with us, brother. Uh, We do count you uh, a wonderful friend and uh, side-by-side soldier in the battles that we're fighting for the kingdom of God and trying to get the gospel going forward. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm so thankful to be on your podcast. I love the Founders Ministry, always have, and benefited uh, before you even I knew you guys personally. Uh, I knew you guys from afar and just always uh, under, uh, understood y'all fighting in the trenches for the rest of us, that there's many, many voices out here and churches across the United States that, do not have the platform, but have the desire for truth, the doctrines of grace. If it, if it's the, the truth of just sticking to the sufficiency of scripture, which is the foundation of everything. Uh, so you're out there battling and we're behind you with prayer and thankfulness that uh, you guys exist. And we're thankful for your ministry. I'm thankful just to know you guys. Yeah. Well, that's mutual, man. Well, you've got this, uh, documentary, the church, the pillar and ground of the truth. And I'm curious as to how that came about. I mean, how did you get into the documentary film business? Well, it was purely, (laughs) I would say on my part, accidental. And to some degree, 
um, uh, I stepped in a hole and I didn't mean to, <laughs> uh, but obviously they, God has providentially worked it out, but it, it happened about seven to eight, you know, going on really in my mind, probably about 16 years ago. Now that I think mm-hmm. about it, how time is flying uh, back when our church was about 20 people were meeting in a little, uh, apartment, not apartment, but a, a mobile home in the woods, um, with about 20 people, we look like a little cult. We believed in the doctrines of grace. So we're, we're kind of a strange little church. And we, I wrote a little pamphlet for our visitors to know what we believe and how we conduct a church. And we had one visitor that came and really loved the pamphlet. And he said, just, um, I turned it into a book. And so that's what I did. I ended up saying, okay, I could make this into a, a little book and, Solid Ground Christian Books is the one who published it many years ago. And then it's gone into several editions. And somehow it got in the hands of Anthony Mathenia, uh, uh, who's a board member of one of the board members of Media Grate. And he suggested to the board that they contact me to do a part of a, 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 a study, not a documentary, but just a study, a six week study, mm-hmm. which at the time seemed pretty doable. It didn't seem like a big, big commitment, uh, pretty easy. They would come to Conway where I live here in Arkansas. They would come here, uh, bring their cameras. Uh, then after talking with them, they said it, it would be better to be a 12 week study. And I thought that would actually be a little easier to, to, you know, sometimes it's harder to condense your mm-hmm. content than it is to, to expand upon it. So I was happy about that. And so we, we were making a, arrangements for that. Then a couple of weeks later, they had a cancellation of, of the, another project they were working on. And they, they had some time open and said, let's go to Europe and let's do this comfort, uh, this teaching series in Europe. And we can integrate historical elements into your lessons. And I thought, well, that's a free trip to Europe. I'd love to do that. Mm-hmm. And so we had this Europe planned trip. And then they called me back a week later and they said, Hey, we're going to be in Europe. We're teaching. We might as well do a documentary. And so I didn't really (laughs) sign up for this originally. And that's when I began to panic because uh, to be honest, I don't view myself as very skilled in that way. I love to preach. I like to write, but I couldn't see myself behind a camera hosting a documentary. And so I prayed for about a week. and then called them back and asked them if not to put them in a bind, but say, like, Hey, can you get another host, someone else that could host it? They could be, uh, maybe my, maybe I'm better for radio or something. I don't know. I just <laughs> said somebody else could do this better. We can resonate <laughs> with you, Jeff. <laughs> so I, I actually attempted to get out of it and um, they, uh, they said, okay, let's, Let's see if we can get an, another host for it. And then I thought, man, I didn't expect that. That's kind of, that's kind of stinks. <laughs> I thought kind of part of me is like, well, I kind of wanted to do it, but I was actually happy because, Hey, um, uh, some moment of a better skill set could, could present it well. And I was still going to be the guy that would write the documentary or write the content behind the documentary. Uh, but after a week, they contacted me back and they said, no, it's your content. It's your book. You should be the one who, host and walks people through it so i submitted to that and then then the long process of hey you need to write you need to write the content behind the the film so it's basically i had a i had to write a small book Mm. um so that's i hear this fell in my lap in a way like here they're going to be a documentary it eventually will be released on netflix and these other streaming devices and i was like i have this this opportunity to say something about the church that I'm a passionate about. And it's like, what is the one thing that I need to say? Cause my book is like four major things about the church, the church, why bother that turned into the church, the pillar of the ground and the truth. As I had four major things that I needed to say, but in the documentary, I need to uh, have one thesis or one main subject. And I concluded that if I had one shot at this thing, the main thing that needed to be communicated to people, is that the word of God, the sufficiency of scripture 
is the very foundation of the church. And if that foundation is ever uh, destroyed or compromised or added to, which is the first step of compromising the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, for, for you compromise the authority of scriptures, you compromise the sufficiency of it. And I I knew that that had to be the thing uh, that I addressed because without the word of God, there's no church mm. uh, simply. And, and that's what I see going on in many churches is they, they have a low view of the, of the scriptures mm. and it, it's, it's primarily seen in their, in the pulpit ministry. And so I, I wanted to really hammer that. So I walked, the documentary is based upon the book that I wrote, which walks through church history. Like what is church history's doctrine of ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church? And I watch how uh, the Catholic church formed by a slow erosion of the authority mm-hmm. of scriptures, which came about first by a slight adding to the scriptures are going away from sufficiency of scriptures or scriptures alone to scriptures plus tradition. And so that's what led to the fall of the church and the recovering of the church and the Reformation is a recovery of the sufficiency and uh, scriptures. You know, it's fascinating, Jeff, uh, you put your finger on one of the most significant distinctions between Roman Catholicism and Protestant Reformed Christianity and that is the relationship of church to scripture and the, our Roman Catholic friends say, you know, the, the church created the scriptures. And so we're the, the guardians of that. We're the ones that tell you what it means. Whereas we say, no, man, the scriptures create the church where the word of God goes, there comes the church. And we seem to not appreciate that distinction as much as we should today in understanding the significance and the finality and the boundaries that the uh, that attain uh, that go with the scripture, and it, when you give those things up, as you said, man, you let other stuff in, and uh, the foundations begin to crumble. Right, right. The, the picture in my head in in church history, and and it's going on today, and you guys are addressing it, which I'm so thankful to God for. But it, my 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 idea of this in my head, the imagery, the illustration in my head is this that. When you build a foundation, you have um, you don't ha- only have the fortitude to hold up the structure, which you need, because you can't build a building on sand or it'll erode and fall down. But you have to have a solid foundation, concrete foundation, or a solid rock to build upon. So uh, the scriptures is that foundation. It's the uh, it's the it's the uh, foundation that holds up the infrastructure. But it not only holds it up, it sets the parameters of the mm. building. And what the Catholic Church did, or how it it uh, evolved into the Catholic Church slowly, is it was it they didn't chip away that foundation that was laid by the apostles, which is the teaching of Christ and the prophets. Uh, and they added additional stones to that foundation, and they begin to add add-ons or lean-tos to mm-hmm. the church. You know, it's like you know my parents. I grew up in a house with my. Uh, parents added onto our house. They, it was kind of like they added onto the foundation and they built the roof line and we got an extra room by adding onto it. Well, that's what they did to the church. The church is to be built up. The foundation is established. The parameters are established. The Catholic church started adding rooms on it and they kept on adding rooms until the whole infrastructure were completely off the original foundation and completely relocated on a new foundation. Mm. And, uh, you had a false foundation, a false church based mm. upon a false authority. Mm. Jeff, when you mentioned some of the parallels between what happened then, what happens now, and my sense is there, there's a lot of um, evangelical Christians that would say, yeah, we, you know, we're sons of the Reformation and the Catholic Church made this problem of adding on, but we feel that we are not doing that. We feel like we are not adding on to the foundation. But people are starting to see ways in which that is happening. There's some extra foundations to, to that are being added on. As you went back and did kind of this historical work and even visiting the sites and other places, did you see uh, any kind of similarities where people back then that were a part of adding on to the foundation would say, well, no, we're really not, and here's why, so that we could identify some of those errors? 
No, yeah, that's exactly right. The early church fathers, uh, good men, I believe some of them were godly men, and I don't believe they were aware of what they were doing. I'm not for sure they understood that a small bullet hole leads you know, to a, a great big hole at, at the end. And they made these subtle little things. Um, it, it seems like a minor um, difference to have three offices in the church rather than two. Mm. And so that's kind of one of the first little steps is you put a, a leading elder above the pastoral board, or you have elders plural, which the Bible teaches. And apparently there will be, you know, the Bible does say that, you know, you're to give double honor to the elder, especially those who labor in word and truth, that they were at the kind of the preaching and teaching elder. Okay. There needs to be a little bit of double honor to those men. So you got this, uh, uh, a little bit of distinctions in scriptures, but then you, you took Ignatius took that and went a little bit further than what the scriptures teach. And they end up creating a three class divisions of the, uh, the office of eldership, which it, minor, minor thing. And, and, and at the time, no one knew that, Hey, this is going to lead to the hierarchical system uh, of the Catholic church in time where you have, uh, archbishops and you know bishops, then archbishops, and eventually the pope. But that is a subtle little little thing that, in time, just keeps on increasing, mm -hmm. and it happens all the time. Even in good churches, you'll have a you know grandma come up to the pastor, one of the pastors, and say, "Hey, you care if my um, grandson does this? Has he got a little skit he'd like to do?" On Sunday morning, <laughs> and the pastor kind of like, ah, you know, I don't see anything wrong with that. You know, that'll be a blessing to everybody. And it, okay, is it altogether heretical? Is it altogether going to tear the church down that day? No, no. It'll it, it could be corrected easily. It could it could be okay. But before you know it, you've left the regulative principle of worship. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, you're you're everybody's got these ideas to bring into the worship service. And there goes the sufficiency of scriptures, the authority of scriptures to guide God's holy worship. So it happens all the time everywhere, and we're not even aware of it. Churches are just unaware that uh, other influences are creeping in, and these influences are fighting for authority, are fighting for uh, what's controlling the church. And we need to always constantly go back and reevaluate why we're doing what we're doing, and can we trace back what we're doing or what we're believing back to scriptures? And if we can't, we need to access. We need to say, "Hey, this is dangerous," um, and, and it's obviously an ongoing danger in the church. Yeah. So the church reformed, always reforming according to the Word of God, uh, believing that That's we right. we do have those tendencies to drift, and so we need to keep coming back. And so today, you know, we're, in in one sense, that, I mean, that's always true. And today we see these uh, efforts to lead us astray, not just with Grandma coming to talk about her grandson doing a skit, but even in grander ways, where we right. have some leaders saying, "Oh." You know, we need this. What What have you observed with that? What do, what do you see going on today on that larger scale? Well, I saw it in my uh, when I was in seminary in college, and saw it when I was doing uh, counseling first. You know, like uh, that people Christians don't have it. A, they don't. They won't accept certain things that society is saying because there seems to be some similar you know, things that Christianity says, and because there's some similar ground or common ground, it seems, they don't question the foundation in which it's coming from. And so there's a, a tendency to try to integrate secularism with Christianity because of some similar similarities. Now, I think of an X in my mind, uh, that there, there, an X crosses at a point, but it has a different uh, starting point or foundation, and it leads completely in the opposite direction. Hmm. And so you find the word crosses and find common ground and just integrate it in. And that's what they did with counseling with secular psychology, which is based upon atheism and evolution, that the culture is to blame and not depravity. And you blame your parenting and the cultural constructs, and you know, which is the same thing as um, 
what's going on basically with the critical race theory and uh, social justice is is that you're blaming the infrastructures of society rather than blaming internal racism or internal problems it's your it's the cultural values it's the institutions like the family or like um uh, businesses or capitalism or whatever this might be. that's the problem that's causing social injustices and ills in societies it's not the heart issues and so racism is a common fight among christians and atheists but we come from it from a totally different foundation and our conclusions go completely different to their conclusions and the church of course fighting anti-racism or fa- fighting against uh, depression and all these other mental illnesses we 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 have solutions and we see problems but we need to evaluate um where where the secular ideologies and philosophies come from Hmm. and we need to reject them because it's antithetical to the biblical foundation of scriptures and so it's 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 come in through feminism it's come in through uh counseling it's now it's coming in through social justice and critical race theory and it's it's ultimately attack upon scriptures. It's attack upon God and His authority. That's really helpful, Jeff. The way that you've explained it, I kind of like the X idea because you know if you're dealing with an X that that both have points on the earth, you know you have two different foundations, and you do have this similarity. There's times where we're saying the same thing. So you mentioned racism. You know you can have a secularist and a Christian both saying we're against racism. You know, right. I did, I did this once and had a, we, Tom and I had a fun talk. I wrote something like this is the most, I think I did about by what standard or something. I said, this is the most anti-racist book you'll ever find, you know? And I, I had a chuckle yeah. because Tom's like, you know, he's like, you know, that's not what they mean. I said, I know, but I'm trying to reclaim the word, but there's this, right. there are these, there are these moments. And so honoring women, you know, it's like, well, a Christian hears that and go, well, absolutely. We want to honor women. And the secular saying we want to honor women. So there's this crossover, but you are, what, what is the actual definition of racism? What's the actual definition of um, honor? You know, that is the point um, that, it, that has to be um, dealt with according to what God has revealed in his word. And it's, that's very important because how easy it is for good Christians to say, well, there's, there's the word honor and, you know, there's the word um, racism and kind of get, get hijacked. So having to always come back and say, no, 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 where, where are we coming from? You know, Jeff, yeah. I, you, you put your finger on something that is so critical. I want to highlight it again about these being heart issues. If you locate the source or the origin of the problem in political structures or in um, capitalism or the, that type of thing, within the solution, you've already pretty well defined the solution or well, where the source of the solution comes from. And so that's what's happened in a lot of these efforts today. And if capitalism's a problem, if uh, governmental uh, structures are the problem, well then the, the only solution is something outside of the gospel. You gotta have political solutions you got to have revolutionary solutions and you lose sight of the gospel. I, I find a lot of our friends say, oh, no, no, we believe the gospel, but the gospel, they won't say this, though, though I've heard it said <laughs> too, too many times by Christian leaders, the gospel's not enough because the gospel didn't change things. I mean, look, you couldn't, you and I couldn't drink the same water fountains 75 years ago and we, and we both had the gospel. Our people both had the gospel back then. So the gospel's not enough. What we need are political solutions to these problems today. And of course, when the church buys into that, it goes right back to what you said. You, know, you start adding to the foundation. It's pretty dangerous. It's a, it, it, again, it goes back to atheism as the foundation of, of all this type of thinking. It's, it's, it's that we're evolved creatures and we're matter. We're, we're not a soul. We're not an eternal soul. We're not going to be judged by God. Sin is redefined. Uh, in fact, man is born innocent and its corruption comes through the environment in which he's born into. Mm-hmm. And so you have... Uh, I no definition of right and wrong as the Bible defines justice because there's no God to give this ultimate standard of right and wrong. So uh, yeah, the ills comes through, like, like we've already pointed out, the infrastructure of society that shapes man. And and so if man is just an evolved creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's it 
it, it it's a materialistic foundation. It's a atheistic foundation. Ultimately, it's an anti-authoritarian, authoritarian uh, uh, objective, trying to root out God and all the authority that God has, because God's got He's ultimate authority, and He's given uh, various jurisdictions. Like the individual has certain inalienable rights that God has given him directly from God, not through the mm-hmm. church or not through the state or not through the family. The family has its own jurisdiction. Uh, the ch- state has its own jurisdiction. The fa- uh, and, the, and the church has its own jurisdiction and all underneath God right. and not underneath each other. Right. And the, these are infrastructures of authority. And that is what is under attack is these delegated authority. And let's uh, basically centralize all that authority, take it away from the individual, take it away from the church, take it away from civil authorities in the plural, take it away from these delegated authorities and replace God who's above it with, with a global entity, a global man-made entity. It is, it's really an ultimate attack upon God in it. You know, man, that's that's really good. That's that's huge, and that's at the center of a lot of what problems are that we're facing today. I want to get back to your uh, documentary, though, man. You you got uh, a list of folks who participated in this. It's really good. I'm looking it over, and it's Bodie Balkum, Josh Bice, uh, Steve Lawson, Sam Waldron, um, Paul Washer, Jeremy Walker, Tom Nettles, Anthony Matheny. I mean, you got a lot of guys on there that are really. I mean, they, that's a lot of firepower in one place to bring into this documentary. Tell me how, how you got those folks and, and uh, what your thinking was as you put together these participants to try to communicate the truth about the church being the pillar and ground of God's truth. Yeah, that was uh, really neat to work with some of these guys and some of them I was able to meet for the first time. Um, uh, I, I think it's mainly because Media Grate has connections with some of these these men was mm-hmm. part of how that worked out. Some of it would be um, when I wrote the book, I didn't write the script. We we had someone that took my book that I wrote and basically put a script to it. But I did say, here are some people that could, I think, answer these questions good. And so um, uh, I just wrote out a list of names that mm-hmm. I would love to see answer the questions. And the one name that we almost got that, that it just didn't quite work out, but it, it was agreeable. Uh, he, he almost, he was agreeable to do it. We just couldn't fit it in. It was John MacArthur. And we almost had him. It would have been, it would have been awesome to get, get him into the, the film. Uh, but it was just like, here are the people that I thought would be good. And uh, then here are the people that were accessible and some of the people were agreeable, but we just couldn't get it to work. And yeah. So it, it turned out well. Jeff, as you traveled in Europe to various places, what was your favorite spot and why? Well, it was neat. I, I've been to all those places uh, multiple times through my life because I love to travel. Um, but if I wasn't a pastor, I would be some type of I find some type of livelihood if I could and some type of travel guide because I just love to travel the world. Uh, but Africa was a place I hadn't been. So uh, going to North Africa was kind of a neat experience. But to see the ruins where Augustine taught and preached was pretty moving to me. Mm. So I, I really enjoyed that. But it was the most dangerous place to film. And uh, we were we would go in somewhat incognito because even the drone, we couldn't take certain equipment in. So we had to leave some of the equipment in Italy. We flew from Rome into Tunisia. Uh, but, and then we would go and do our filming real quick, put our cameras away and, and um, act like we're tourists. So that was kind of a, a little um, see, neat to see the sites, but also a little adrenaline of, uh, not like you feel like you're breaking the law, but you know you're being watched. Uh, so that was kind of, uh, I thought it was kind of fun. Mm. Uh, the o- only thing that is aggravating about that is I, I pick up rocks everywhere I go. I have a rock collection of all the countries I visited. And I'll come back and put the date and where it's from. And the, the, the desire to get a rock is I need a rock that's, that I think's never been moved by human hands. It's, it's natural. And it come from that country. 
Until and, your hands got uh, it, right? <laughs> my hands got it. Yeah, I'm the, I mean, surely maybe someone else has touched it. But it's, it's just a natural look. It's not like a rock in a parking lot. And I pull it out. And they told me, the film crew and the directors, don't take anything out. They'll, they'll, and the customs, they'll question you. They'll be delayed. They'll look at the camera stuff. And so I'm like, okay, I can't get a rock. And, uh, and I also get um, coins. And we get on the plane back to Italy and all, all the other guys are pulling out <laughs> their coins and things. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm following the letter of the law. I didn't bring anything back with me. And I'm kind of frustrated that uh, I didn't get my rock. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening to this from Tunisia, would you get a rock and mail it to Jeff? Yeah, send it to Jeff. That's right. <laughs> for my collection. That's, That's right. great. Jeff, man, thanks so much for being here with us on the Sword and the Trail. Yeah. We're uh, so excited about this documentary and pray that God would richly bless it to the edification of the church as they consider God's gracious work to the church throughout history as he has sustained the church and the church continues to be a pillar and buttress of the truth today. Yeah, we will link to the documentary so folks can find access to it uh, in the notes that go along with this uh, episode. But brother, thank God for you. Thank you for your ministry. We look forward to fellowshipping with you again before too long. Hey, would you stay around for about about five minutes and we're going to do a little armory content. Is that all right with you, Jeff? Sounds great. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the Sword and the Trial today. Press on. Don't grow weary in doing good.